Now they could afford to start a few more channels, grow a few more tendrils, they had a moral obligation to their shareholders to do so. Granada came along at exactly the right time for both companies, and the pact was sealed at the very end of 1995 to form the joint venture Granada Sky Broadcasting, or GSB, or GSKYB, as it was also known over Granada's objections. Three, two, one, seven new channels. Launching on your TV. On October 1st, 1996. The deal initially involved eight new channels. This was later pared down to four, with one of them becoming a gestalt. This was Granada Good Life, essentially the family circle network, and one of the linchpins of the whole deal, the main place to go for original programming. Obviously, that's original in the sense of being newly made, not in the sense of being original. Good Life consisted of four substations at different times of the day, mostly following a half assed this and that pattern. Regardless of the time of day, it was perpetual daytime television hell. There was Home and Garden for your DIY and weed killer tips, Health and Beauty for your loose women slash this morning fix. Food and wine to make that microwave ready meal seem even more like society's punishment for being lonely. And the watchdog aping Granada TV High Street for the angrier failures. The latter was apparently so unprepossessing that no publicly viewable footage of it seems to exist outside of this pre launch promo video. Completing the this and that motif, but on its own channel, was Granada Men and Motors. This essentially anticipated the 21st century incarnation of Top Gear, right down to its faces. This, though, is not the first time that Lotus have had a hand up a Proton's frock. The sparkly little Satria GTI boasts Lotus underpinnings, and that goes like a scalded ferret down a sprinter's shorts. It is quick. Except that it skipped the opening few series when it was good, and went straight to its leering, pre apic self-satisfied racist later years. There was also Granada Talk TV, Britain's first dedicated talk show channel, which sounds to me like being trapped in the departure lounge of an airport with the same eight bickering couples for the rest of your life. This was mostly notable for launching the careers of Natasha Kaplinsky and Sasha Baron Cohen. The latter presented the Daily Kids show in the manner of a terrifying Middle Eastern elemental hosting the Big Breakfast. Hey, the first ever F2F. I'm filming it, I'm videoing it, I'm going to share it to my parents, this is history, we've been here. boo boo boo, give us some noises, give me some noise. Hey! Oh, yes! Hello! Fanta I like that little, fantastic little rapper. Hello, I'm Sasha Baron Cohen and welcome to F2F, the first show on British television where every day you get to make the programme, yes! The former was the glamour stooge on the Paul Ross show, which is undeniably worse than being the glamour stooge for the Daily Mail along with most other female newsreaders to this very day. Still, at least it had InVision continuity, albeit the most oddly bleak InVision continuity I've ever seen. At three o'clock we had Showbiz UK with Andrea Boardman. Today she's talking to Jason Don. Now you might have seen him snogging on the English patient. Well now he's PC Brian Rainford in LWT's smash hit Woken Well. On the show also... I don't know what it is, but there's something oddly desperate and needful about it. With that tiny space. I get the feeling he's trapped and being forced to read links at gunpoint. I feel like ordering a chopper to airlift him to safety. All very, very good reasons to stay tuned to Talk TV. But the flagship G Sky B channel was undoubtedly Granada Plus. With UK Gold having rehabilitated the concept of repeats, everyone with a back catalogue was falling over themselves to get space to re air them on satellite, with all new adverts and everything. Granada Plus understandably consisted of old episodes of Coronation Street, The Comedians and Crown Court from the Granada archives, plus the likes of On the Buses and Two's Company from the newly acquired LWT. Plus was easily and probably inevitably the most successful G Sky B channel of all, and actually benefited from Granada's continual franchise gobbling. 
The acquisition of Yorkshire Tyne Tees allowed them to add Classic Emmerdale to Classic Coronation Street, alongside the likes of the Bidebeck trilogy and about 58 hours worth of Catherine Cookson adaptations, while Anglia provided them with Survival and Sale of the Century. Eventually, they were even buying up old BBC programmes, albeit the ones that few remembered and fewer still actually wanted to see ever again. And as far as the idents went, as you've seen, they were mostly identical, centering around that squared oval G, a loose combination of the Granada and Sky logos of the time, minus the arrow, which Granada obviously really wanted to become iconic and didn't. In hindsight, it probably isn't surprising that Granada Plus was almost the only one of these seven in four channels that anyone actually bothered watching. The first to fall off the cliff of mass public indifference was Talk TV, which lasted less than a year. Oddly enough, it died with the Princess of Wales. The station was replaced with rolling Sky News coverage on August 31st, 1997, and then never came back again. And no one noticed. Good Life was the next to go, its four personalities consolidated into one under the name Granada Breeze. Daytime TV for the genuinely desperate. The newly rechristened Breeze was then forced to flat share with Men and Motors, which, much to Granada's dismay, had been the only other station that anyone stayed with for longer than it took to push the next channel button on the remote. This newly consolidated G Sky B package of three stations on two channels stabilised somewhat, and just in time. But before I can go forward, I have to go back to just prior to the launch of G Sky B. While Granada were hatching deals with Sky, their fellow region gobblers Carlton were looking on covetously. At the time the G Sky B deal was being put together, ravenous conglomerate Pearson were adding production company Select TV to their portfolio. Select TV had also run a minuscule cable channel of the same name in which Pearson either weren't interested or were prescribed from keeping. Enter Carlton. Not exactly a partnership with Sky, but it was a foothold. Before the end of the year, Carlton had already muscled into Select TV's downtime with the Carlton Food Network. Riding the mid-90s wave of cookery shows. A dizzying period when it seemed like every third new commission involved an egg whisk. Initially, it was on for a paltry five hours a day, noon till five, until 1997, when its hours were extended from nine till five, and where Select TV once was, now sat Carlton Select. Basically the same idea as Granada Plus, only with a far smaller back catalogue. Fortunately for Carlton, they owned Central by now, which made Carlton Select at times like living in Birmingham circa 1989. They also had the old Select TV portfolio, which in terms of things people might actually want to watch, basically amounted to a fistful of Marks and Grand sitcoms and Pie in the Sky. No, not that one. The eye dents, however, was certainly superior to any of Granada's. The jaw-dropping relaunch of BBC Two by Martin Lambie Nairn and Company, and in fact even before then, the brilliant tableau created for BSB by Pentagram, had kicked off a minor but real vogue in mid-90s television design for, for want of a better phrase, faintly surreal representationalism. Sadly, after BBC Two, these were really only seen off the beaten track. We never got to see, say, Anglia represented by a reflection in a mirror shattering backwards in slow motion or anything. When the CFN Select Alliance didn't collapse after a year, they were joined by three further channels. Carlton Cinema saw random movies squeezed painfully into a tiny space because widescreen TV had only just been invented. The audience for Carlton Kids, such as it was, 
was inevitably made up almost exclusively of 20 to 40 year olds who remembered these shows from their own childhoods. And finally, there was Carlton World, whose purpose was never clear, but which had the best idents of all. I love this kind of thing, centred on real props and in-camera effects. I've eulogised about this before, but anyone can build impossible things with a computer. But to use real objects with real weight and dimension, and only then take them to CGI world in post-production, that really does make a difference. It adds an extra, undefinable touch, reminiscent of the work of the late Storm Thorgerson and Hypgnosis. At their best, they created, within reality, a split second in which an impossible image could exist. And idents like these, or Lambie Nance for BBC Two, pulled off the same trick. It's just a shame about the station, really, because Carlton World seemed to exist mostly for the sake of it. Its programming was largely factual, but beyond that, the main difference between it and Carlton Select was the odd original program, or more often, newer repeats. Admittedly, that's only as far as I can tell, because very little of Carlton World remains to this day. It must be one of the least remarked upon channels in British television history, and an almost criminal waste of really good idents.